Hey, everybody, it's Ben. Uh, First things first, if you listened to season one of this podcast, there's no way you don't remember Christine from episode four. Her handle on social media is ticking out loud. That's how a lot of people know her. And uh, I'm still not fully caught up on this yet, because like I said, I've, I've been traveling for the past couple weeks and I've had limited access to any sort of rich media on my phone. But what I do know is that her housing situation has been uh, problematic and troubling, and it's because she hasn't been able to find a job. Uh, the Tourette community has been very supportive and kind of putting out the word to try to help her. And I don't want what I do here to just be plain and simple, you know, slacktivism. So all I can say is that if you're in the Toronto area and you do know of job openings, get in touch with me. I can get you Christine's resume. I can put you in touch with her. She has a lot of business development experience, business optimization experience. So I'm just saying all this and starting off the show this way because it, you know, it, it, she was a big part of season one, and it hurts to see somebody who was influential on this show in need of help. So again, my email is Podcast at gmail.com. Actually, I'll just go ahead and put her resume and the link to the episode with the show notes to this episode at tourettespodcast.libson.com. So go back and listen to her episode. Um, Again, she definitely helped me in my decision to be open and proud about having Tourette syndrome versus seeing it as something that might be shameful or something to keep a secret. That's why her handle on social media is ticking out loud. So if you can help in any way, that would be amazing. All right, we have a great episode this week. Let's start it off now. When everybody has Tourette's, it's like nobody's different. Hey everybody, it's Ben, back home after a couple weeks of traveling that all swirled around my lady and I getting married. Ambrose and I, uh, you, you've heard her on the podcast before. Um, the time we had, it, it was just phenomenal. It was amazing. It was a wedding slash honeymoon all in one with just us traveling and kind of going where we wanted to go and buying our wedding clothes along the way, even buying our wedding rings along the way. Very much like a scavenger hunt. So we kind of designed it that way, kept it really loose, which made it a lot of fun and I guess more memorable for us. We also found the wedding venue along the way. We got married in Hortus Botanicus, which is this uh, centuries old botanical garden and greenhouse complex in Amsterdam, which by the way, cemented itself as our favorite city on earth. There's no way that I can explain it to do it justice here, but that's the highlight version of my time away and pre-programming episodes so we wouldn't miss a week on the podcast here. Thanks to Yvette and Demi for keeping it alive while I was out, and as always, thanks to Sophia, who admins the Tourette's Podcast discussion group on Facebook. Join up if you haven't already. It's easy. You just ask permission to join and answer a few quick, easy questions kind of so we know that you're not a troll or a robot, for example, and then you're in and you can connect with other listeners or discuss what's on your mind with a particular episode or anything else, observations, questions, anything under the tent of Tourette syndrome. One thing I noticed about myself on the wedding trip, even though I've, I've gone from being a closeted Touretter to an open and proud Touretter, no matter what anybody thinks, I still found myself trying to suppress ticks on the trip. I was guarding myself a bit, you know, not necessarily in a conscious way, but it was just something I was doing, like like downplaying my tics in certain situations. And and this was primarily in airports. I get so nervous and anxious in airports, like all the usual stuff, you know, something happening at the at the security checkpoint or losing your luggage, which by the way, I do have a story about that from this trip, but um or, or just, you know, all the frazzling stuff that can happen while traveling. But this time I was maybe, I don't know, just part of my brain took over and said, you know, if you tick in a crazy, obvious way, people are going to stare at you. And it might turn into a situation where people get into the spirit of, you know, if you see something, say something, and then boom, here comes the big misunderstanding that prevents me from flying to my wedding. Like that was maybe preconsciously, if I'm using that term correctly, uh, driving the security management part of my brain and saying, you know, You've got some ticks coming up and we're going to suppress them for you so you don't get into trouble. I do have some obvious vocal ticks that have a, a rhythm and could easily be, you know, misunderstood. Or at least that's my anxiety, that I'd be misunderstood, even though a simple explanation would probably diffuse the whole thing if anybody had any questions and I'm probably totally overthinking it. But regardless, uh, some part of me just kind of wanted to play it safe with my TS 
And I'm wondering if any of you openly to Reading people out there have the same experiences. Are you okay with your TS except for fill in the blank? Talk about it over at the uh, discussion group or send me an email, Podcast at gmail.com. By the way, there is a lot of great discussion happening in the uh, discussion group on Facebook. But uh, g- going back to vocal tics, um, one of the questions that I've received a-, a few times lately is why don't we hear your tics on the podcast? So the, the quick assumption from a lot of listeners is that I just edit them out, edit my tics out of the show. And that's uh, sort of correct, but, but definitely not my intention. The simple explanation is that my editing software does it kind of incidentally. So, so often when I'm ticking, it's between sentences or when I'm listening to the person I'm interviewing. And often when that's happening, I'm, I distance myself from the microphone a little bit. You know, I just kind of sit back and listen. And, and to get a little bit technical, uh, this kind of microphone that I'm using is a dynamic microphone, which I, I guess in the context here kind of means that it's not a very sensitive microphone and you need to get really close to it when you're talking. So when there's distance between myself and the microphone, it doesn't pick up as much sound from me or from anything else. And then you factor in uh, my recording software, which has this plugin called a noise gate. And that basically silences all the sound when I'm not talking directly into the microphone. And that means my ticks are silenced as well. So it's never my intention to edit out my ticks. It just kind of happens by process. But if you want to know what my ticks, my, my most prominent ticks sound like, uh, here's a quick montage. Okay, hope you enjoyed those uh, scraps of sound. Um, And I've been talking too much, but thanks to everybody for their kind words while I was away, and thanks to everyone who's gone to the discussion group to weigh in and communicate about TS or about episodes of the podcast. Okay, so who have we got this week? Well, we're going to keep with the theme of airports and airplanes with Zach. He's a flight attendant with Tourette syndrome, and he does not disappoint on this episode. Really great conversation. Notably, he's also been involved with Tourette's Camp, or properly called Camp Twitch and Shout. I get a lot of questions about that that I can't answer because I'm not involved with it, but Zach brings the answers. Uh, We talk about that and more, and you'll definitely think highly of him as we get into this conversation. So let's get to it. Here's Zach. Uh, My name's Zach. Uh, Personally, I'm a... uh, Where I live is kind of complicated. I'm a flight attendant. Uh, so I, um, I'm from Nashville. I grew up just outside of Nashville my whole life, yeah. but right now I am based in Detroit, Michigan. So I, uh, I have a little, what they call a crash pad, um, that I mm-hmm. live in up, up there when I can't commute home. Gotcha. And of course I'm working a lot. So I'm in hotels all across the country and the, the world. So my home is everywhere. Uh, we, we fly all over the world, so, um, I don't really have a route or anything yet, but, uh, I do, I do mostly domestic stuff, but, um, I've been flying for about a year and a half and, um, I've done four international trips. The last one I did was in January. I went to Lima, Peru. So nice. Uh, Did did you pick being a flight attendant for that purpose or, I mean, was it kind of that, that allure of travel or, uh, yeah, that was part of it. Um, it honestly kind of just it just happened. Like a lot of people I work with kind of had this like dream of being a flight attendant, either their parents Mm -hmm. did it or they just always wanted to do it. Or that's not the case for me. It literally just kind of popped up. Like I wanted to travel. I'm good with people. Um, and my degree is in nutrition. Um, Mm -hmm. and I went down a long field of trying to be a dietitian and I, I hit a road where like, I realized I didn't want to do that anymore. It wasn't going to make me happy. So I just kind of took a step back and decided to make a change. And here I am. Nice. Nice. I mean, the the travel part's got to be cool, but uh, do do you get much free time to kind of roam around the destinations you go to, or is it just flight to flight? Yeah. Yeah. I've had, uh, I've had some, some really cool layovers and stuff. It depends on the trips that they build for us, but, um, Typically, yeah. uh, I do have enough time to roam around and kind of get out and explore. Do, do you have a, a, a choice like location? I mean, just, just one place that you're kind of aching to go back to? Oh, Portland, Oregon. I don't know what it is about that city, but Portland, Portland Oregon yeah. is a great, a great one. Um, and then great Reno, Reno, I got to go up to Lake Tahoe for the first time and it just blew my mind. How nice. Beautiful it was. Nice. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, th- this this might be, I don't know if this is a dumb question or not, but I mean, all the people that you kind of get to see day in and day out, do you interact with other people who have Tourette's syndrome or do, do you, I mean, do, do you pick up on that when you're on a flight or? Yeah. So, um, I have, like I said, I've been flying about a year and a half and I have seen one person on an airplane with Tourette's. Um, and okay. I knew, I knew it when I saw him. I, um, yeah. I didn't say, I didn't say anything, but, uh, during the service, I, he had some, some small vocal tics. Uh, and some facial twitches, and I was—I just leaned in. He was in the middle seat, and I just kind of leaned into him. I was like, "Hey, man, look, don't take this the wrong way, but like, you have Tourette's." And he was like, "Yeah," and I was like, "Oh, me too. Awesome, cool." So we kind of talked about like, you know, bio ticks and things like that. Uh, and then yeah. I was like, All right, "I'll take care of you, man. Like, don't worry. Like, we're good." Um, That's awesome. But outside of that, no. Um, of course, I do. Outside of work, I do a lot of stuff in the Tourette's community where I've yeah. met people with Tourette's and have friends now with Tourette's and, but uh, as far as gotcha. work goes, just, just one person. So, so you do, do work within the community. So, so advocacy type work or, um, uh, what, what, what form does that take? Yeah. So it started, uh, four years ago, I was actually in Africa. Um, and this, this will all come back around, but I was in Africa and I was an intern with a study abroad company and my program coordinator, um, her, she was telling me about this camp for kids with Tourette's. And I was like, that yeah. place doesn't exist. Like, what are you talking about? Like, she's like, no, my sister is a nurse at this camp. It's called Camp Twitch and Shout in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. It's in uh, Winder, Georgia. And so she put me in touch with the pro- the camp director at that time. And we exchanged some emails. And when I got back, she was like, yeah, come on down. We need some more guy volunteers. So I drove down the <laughs> next day and I've been doing that for four years now. Uh, the camp council oh, awesome. down there, and it's been, it's the best week of the year. And then uh, this past year, I was actually asked to speak at the TAA conference in Washington D.C. as a keynote speaker uh, to uh, one of the lunch talks. Uh, six of us uh, from camp, um, either that were uh, previous campers or counselors, um, were asked to come and speak to the parents and the kids and everything. And that was a really, really cool opportunity. God, that, so I, I want to kind of get into that. I mean, yeah. could you describe the camp and, and sort of, you know, what happens at the camp? How long is it? Just kind of give us a rundown of, uh, yeah, of how so it works. It's a, uh, it's like a five night, uh, overnight camp. And, uh, to, in order to come to this camp as a camper, you have to be diagnosed with Tourette's. Um, and it's ages, I think something like eight to 17, Mm-hmm. Um, there's boys and girls and really the camp's just a, a place for kids to come and just be normal kids, like have a, a, a normal summer experience because when everybody has Tourette's, it's like, nobody's different. You know, it's like, you're not being right. judged. You're not being bullied. You're not being like, you just, everyone just gets you. And, um, you know, the camp is obviously for the, the kids, but at the same time, like, I look forward to that week so much because it's like one week out of the year that me and my other friends with Tourette's can show up and not have to hide anything, not have to like, we just be ourselves. Um, and it feels so good. Like, cause I mean, just, and just listening to other episodes, you know, some people hide their ticks, some people don't. Um, Mm -hmm. I find myself hiding them a lot. I, I, I tick a lot, but I also find myself suppressing them in public, especially on airplanes and things like that. I have to be careful about, um, the image that I'm presenting. Right. And, um, so camp is just a place it's, it's incredible. Um, and so, like I said, I've been doing that for four years and, um, uh, the kids just absolutely, I mean, it's been literally, it's been quoted as saying it's, it's like the best place on earth, even better than Disney world. Um, hmm. you know, they're, crying when they leave they don't want to leave they they look forward to this week more than oh, anything man. in the world so when when kids show up i mean I, I assume it's kids who didn't know each other previously they go to this camp um are are they kind of quickly do they kind of get the context of, of what it is that they are allowed to and i use allowed in quotes everybody's allowed but they don't feel any social pressure to hide their ticks or anything like that i mean do they warm up to that kind no, of thing yeah, or yeah. so um and obviously, so we'll have kids that have been to camp before and they come back and they see their old buddies and everything. But we also have a lot of, new, you know, new kids every year. And yeah. they, they, I feel like they do quickly. Like, for instance, this year I had uh, my cabin. Well, I was the cabin leader for the tw- uh, 10 to 12 year old boys. And we yeah. had a total of, I think, nine kids. And I think like 
or we had 10 kids and eight of them were new. Um, yeah. but, but like none of them were high, like none of them, they all felt, uh, open to take, you know, they didn't have to hide anything. They didn't feel like they didn't feel uncomfortable taking or anything like that because it was quickly. And at camp, like I am, I'm in, I don't hide anything. So like, especially, you know, if they see someone that's like the cabin leader or one of our counselors ticking, they also feel like, I feel like they can feel better about ticking themselves, you know, or not as yeah, bad, yeah. Uh, you know, not having to hide anything. So, and they all become friends quickly, you know, so they bond over Tourette's brings them together, but then they start to figure out that they have other things in common and, and they're just kids. Oh, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, so a, as a counselor and I mean, so are, are kids bringing you questions about, I mean, are, are there any life lesson stuff or anything like that? Uh, no, not really. Question, um, not really. Um, you know, we, there's certain boundaries that we, you know, we, we try to stay out of personal lives of the campers as, as their counselors, just from a mm-hmm. legal standpoint, you know, we, there's certain things we can't talk about. Um, right. as far yep. as like stuff back home or whatever, um, we're there to, you know, just bring them the best week possible. But of course we try to teach them things, you know, teach them, um, leadership, responsibility, kindness, courage, friendliness, things like that, that they can take with them when they go back home. That's so cool. And is it a mix of, um, just, just kind of thinking in the role model context, is it male and female counselors and I mean, a yeah. good kind of cross section of people? Yeah. It's, uh, we had, uh, I think 150 kids this year, something like that. And then something like, I don't even know how many counselors we had, but we had a good a number of counselors and uh, a lot of females, uh, a lot of males. And, and, the there's, um, we kind of pair the, the age groups are grouped by color. And so this year we kind of blended some of the girls with the guys just kind of help, um, from a social aspect, like, um, of course a lot of these kids are teenagers, so they're awkward as is, mm-hmm. you know, like everyone was going through that awkward teenage phase. So mm-hmm. right. trying to teach yeah. them social skills from a normal standpoint. And then also from a Tourette standpoint, like, just kind of blend everything together. So putting girls and guys together and activities we would do out of camp and, um, younger kids with older kids to kind of, you know, mix there as well. So d- did you say earlier that you, you hide your ticks or you have a tendency to hide your ticks or you don't? Uh, it, it depends on where I am. Who I'm with, honestly. Um, yeah. If I'm on an airplane, the good thing about planes are they're loud. Okay. So like my tick, right. Yeah. Um, I have something similar to your, where you kind of do just like the, the little, little throat mm-hmm. clearing or which right. I can disguise yeah. as a cough. Okay. That one's easy to hide. Um, I have echolalia, which started last year, right before hurricane, whatever the, the hurricane hit Houston was. And for yeah, some reason, yeah. right before that hurricane hit the word or the letter H was something that stuck with me. So I couldn't even mention the city that in, that that's in Texas, you know, without having to say that city like six or seven times until I just said it just right. Um, and there's certain other words that I pick up on, but again, it's loud on an airplane, so I can kind of talk yeah. to myself more so than. Um, but I do have some facial tics that are hard to hide. I stick my tongue out all the way, like not just like I stick my tongue out as far out as it can go. And I have a really big tongue too. So um, <laughs> with that, I can, Yeah. I'll, sometimes I'll just do it and pretend like I'm just kind of stretching my jaw or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, I've got the blinking and the, there's like a heavy wink I do on one of my eyes. Mm-hmm. I try not to look at people when I do that. Just right. I, don't want, I don't want any like, misconceptions going on. Um, what else? Well, with with the, uh, the echolalia, I, I don't want to um, set anything off for you, but yeah. when you said you, you you say a word until you kind of get it right, Houston what is, is the word. yeah, and what is what is if we're okay to talk about that? Yeah. What does yeah, getting right. it right feel like? You know, how do you how do you know that you've gotten it right? What does that feel like? I, I, yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, uh, it's just I'll emphasize certain parts of the word. So if you just said okay the word Houston, like a normal person, you know, it's, but like for me, when I say it, it I, I emphasize the last part of the word really strongly, mm-hmm. or like the, like the Hughes, 
Gotham part, I, I don't know. I, I don't know where it came from. Huh. Um, there's a couple other words that are really sounds or letters like H is one, uh, J right. or G. There's some sounds that like really use my, I guess sounds that use my, um, my tongue or my mouth a lot. Like those hmm. types of sounds. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's just a certain, I'll get to a certain point where I'm like, okay, like that's enough. Huh? Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, yeah, I, I kind of wonder if it feels kind of, you know, with my tics and, and the ones that I kind of have to go through to, to kind of get right. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, I, I inevitably revisit them, you know, minutes later and go through the cycle again, but there's always some kind of physical kind of piece that I feel like has to be kind of satisfied. And when you said your tongue, I mean, that, that's kind of what I got curious about if it involves yeah. your tongue or, or kind of just doing something, hitting something the right way to be able to move on. It's, it's the weirdest thing, but I mean, I do it too. It's, it's just kind of part of having it, I guess. Uh, yeah, I guess. And I guess I, I never really thought about it, uh, but I guess it is my tongue because I have a separate tick with where I stick my tongue out and yeah. just the way it's the way it feels on my bottom lip and then yeah. on, on the bottom of my tongue as well. Um, yeah. I mean, those don't really bother me though that much. Um, I guess yeah. they're not really, I have one tick that bothers me, um, like bothers me, okay. bothers me. And it's because it's painful. Um, I have a twitch in my lower back where I will, I started doing this in 2012. Um, yeah. I picked it up when I was, I was really, really into fitness, a lot of cardio, um, like mm -hmm. high intensity stuff. And there was a move or something I did, a workout move I did, and it felt good or felt right or something at one point. But mm -hmm. like now I'm do I've been doing it like hundreds of times a day, every day for five years, six years. And now it's gotten to the point where, uh, like my pelvis is tilted to that side and like, uh, my oh, hips wow. hurt and my, there's like yeah. a pinch nerve. Like if I could get rid of, I wouldn't get rid of my threat, but if I could just get rid of that tick, like <laughs> my life would be a lot better. Wow. I mean, just to take a shot in the dark, is, is it where you kind of like the very base of your back, you kind of, kind of jut it inward, almost like a reverse kind of arch. I mean, is it kind of like that? Cause that's something I've had. Something like that. Yeah. It's more to the side. Like I'll, I, I'll bring my right side of my back up and the yeah. left, uh -huh. my left hip drops. And yeah. that's, that's the one I've been doing for years. And I've got, I've, I've been to a chiropractor yeah. that helps a little bit. I mean, what, what's that like for you? Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. So I kind of get this, it's almost like a feeling when you are stretching and the kind of like pleasurable feeling you kind of get when you stretch a certain yeah. way. And so I'll do that. And, and yeah, I'll kind of, arch the very base of my back kind of inward, almost like I'm thrusting forward in a way, but, but exactly as you described, kind of diagonal and on the side that isn't dropped, like, like it's almost like my hip is pushing a certain direction. Mm -hmm. I will get that same kind of pleasurable stretching kind of feeling almost like I'm kind of like, and it's not stretching. It's the opposite. I'm kind of like, right. um, uh, kind of bringing everything together, but just kind of the way it all connects, it does kind of have this kind of almost like a massage kind of feeling. But mm -hmm. if you do it a number of times, and I would do it when I was, you know, sitting down at work and I haven't done this in a while, but, but yeah, it, it would, it's something I would totally tire of. And I hope it doesn't come back to me now. Like I say every week when right. I talk about yeah. ticks, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. Th that's, that's kind of funny. And that's one that I think I hadn't even really put much attention on or thought into it just kind of happens and then it happens and then it just kind of doesn't and and a lot of ticks are like that and i guess it hadn't driven me to the point where i was really feeling any sort of um you know pain in any mm -hmm. you know, kind of long term or even short term sense but when you do have a, a tick that causes you pain do you do you do anything about it do you medicate i think you said you saw a chiropractor but uh any anything else on top of that uh, yeah. So I went to a chiropractor, um, and you know, he gave me, he worked on me and he gave me an insole for my left shoe, which helped a mm. lot. It, it, it mm. the pain pretty much, the tick pretty much stopped, uh, like, uh, or at least the pain did. And, right. you know, I was seeing him several times a week for a couple of months, but then I slowly stopped. I think that's around the time when I, I started working, uh, with this job and kind of, it got harder to do. So, I don't see him as much anymore. Um, as far as medication goes, uh, I'll, let me, I'll backtrack to that. Um, I'm sure. just pretty much just stretching. 
Um, I've tried some stretches, you know, there's several different stretches I can do for my hips. It's more so my hips now than my back, my hips pop all the time. And my left hip right now, it's been bothering me for like a week, like mm-hmm. where it's, it's just my, my uh, hip flexors are tight all the time. And I work out mm-hmm. a lot too. So maybe I'm not I'm just not stretching good enough. I know for a fact I'm not, but, uh, and I'm hoping that, you know, in working out, I can just kind of work through it or, but, um, as far as medication for, I mean, for just this tick, like nothing more than just ibuprofen or anything like that when it gets, you know, too unbearable. But as far as for Tourette, yeah. um, I tried three different medications and I don't remember the name of the first one. It was like, I don't even know what it was. It, it wasn't effective. I don't know if the dose was too small or I just gave up on it too fast. I don't like taking medicine. Yeah, um, I never yeah. have. And so the second medicine, it was either clonazepam or uh, clonidine, one of those two. Mm-hmm, and it made right. me feel like a zombie. Um, I mean, yeah. I, that, was in, that was in college. Cause I, I didn't get diagnosed until I was 20, uh, 20 years old. But I've, I've had it my whole life as far as far back as I can remember. And we can talk about that in a second if you want. But uh, the that medicine, I was like sleeping through my alarm, sleeping through classes. And that's not me. Like I can wake up. Oh, yeah. On a normal day, I wake up on the first alarm and I'm out of bed. Like on these, I was like waking up three hours later, not knowing what happened. And yeah, so, I tried, so you're more yourself with yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you're more and, yourself when you have Tourette syndrome, and and it's kind of unchecked, and there, there are the things that come with it that are not as you know enjoyable, like things that cause mm-hmm. you pain. But overall, I mean, with the remedies out there, you would rather just just kind of go with it. Yeah, and that's exactly how I felt about it. I I would rather uh, just I, I'm not going to go through life in a daze, a constant daze, because I need this medicine or whatever. Like I'll take the ticks. And whatever comes with that, um, yeah. and at least at the time, you know, like that may change. I may change my mind. I don't know. Like, you know, hopefully this tick will go away. And but you know, it maybe it gets to the point where it it, it hurts too bad or what. Like I need to control it or I don't know. Yeah. But um, the third one I tried was actually Marinol, which is synthetic marijuana, yeah. and uh, that was an interesting one. Um, that. Huh. Again, I, I did. I don't know if it was the dose was too small or I just didn't stay on it long enough. I don't know. Um, yeah, hey, that's actually a cancer drug, and uh, I actually I was applying for life insurance at the time, and they denied me because of that drug. Really? Um, yeah. Huh. And um, and then I also failed a drug test on that drug as well, so I got off of that. Um, what, what, what were you getting, uh, from that? Cause it, this has come up a couple of times in emails I've gotten recently and, you know, some Twitter messages and, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, wh- how would you kind of rate that experience or what were the positives, negatives, that kind of thing? I, I, there wasn't, you know, I expected like there was no, I guess what I expected going into it before taking that medicine. Like, I don't know if I was just saying, I don't know if I expected some high or something like that like that would just kind of like relax me or something but like and like Mm -hmm. i don't know i I didn't stay on it very long because once yeah once Mm -hmm. kind of the 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 life insurance thing and the drug testing i was like okay i can't like this is this is i gotta find something else or just nothing at all so Mm -hmm. i didn't i don't know if i stayed on it long enough honestly but you know it was recommended by my neurologist so this was about three years after my diagnosis. I was going through some stuff. I, I really, honestly, I just got dumped and I was just, my anxiety was through the roof yeah. and, um, my ticks were just out of control. And so, um, I was willing to try anything, you know, obviously that was legal or whatever. And yeah. Yeah. so that's when I, I think I brought it up to my neurologist and he said, yeah, it might be a good idea to give it a shot. Um, yeah. Just and just telling him what I was going through. So diagnosed at twenty. How old are you now? I'm twenty six. Twenty six. Okay. And, and so what? Uh, you, you had mentioned you know kind of things were rough at the time period and all that. I mean, did mm-hmm. that did that feed into you looking for answers for yourself or what led to the diagnosis? Why you know twenty versus six? Right. Um, and I think it's going to come. Uh, you'll hear a repeating theme just from some of your other episodes where, you know, so I'm like six years old, seven, eight, whatever. And 
I started mm-hmm. displaying some of the very first signs where the, the eye blinking, the head nodding. Um, yeah. I had some very unique ticks as well. Looking back, um, this is back when uh, PlayStation still had wired controllers. <laughs> and okay. uh, I, I would I would be really into I played a lot of sports games, but I would be really into the games, um, so focused. Um, and I would basically whip the controller like just constantly like with the with the cord back and forth yeah 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 um and looking back like everyone always laughed at me like and i didn't i wasn't like upset about it or anything it was just something i did um so you had that <laughs> and i had this little like hop step anytime i started walking somewhere i had the, i guess it was the sensation on the bottom of my feet i had to feel where i did this little i would like hop back and then push off my it was a i can't even describe it um and then just growing up, I, those those really didn't go away. Um, and early teenage years, I mentioned uh, something. My my parents had always just said, "Oh, like you just got habits." Like you know, like many people have said, yeah. you just got nervous habits. And mm-hmm. I just took them. I just took them for their word. I was like, okay. My dad was like, I I used to have the same habits, you know. Hmm. And looking back, like he honestly probably had or does have. Yeah like Tourette's um, and which I, there's, I can talk about that in a, a later on. We actually had a discussion like last week, but um, they always just brushed it off as habits, you know? And of course at this time, all you know about Tourette's is anything, anytime you watch Deuce Bigelow or some, yeah. you know, something in South Park or, you know, it's the stereotypical stuff, you know, and I wasn't exhibiting mm-hmm. any of that. So, um, and I was a good student and that's, that's where my mom always kind of like, she was, you know, he's, he's not struggling. He has friends. Uh, he's, he plays sports. He's doing well in school His teachers. Like, so she's just kind of like, no, like, and it got to the point yeah. where in, co- in college, I think it was, of course, college is a stressful time. So I think just the stress, just adding up, um, I think I'd started that lower back tick and then my other, my vocal tics were ramping up. And uh, about a year prior to going to a neurologist, I went to my primary care physician. And I, someone else that you've interviewed said the same thing. And I, I was like, oh my gosh, I can relate to that. So I went to my primary care physician and said, I think I have Tourette's. And he said, no, you don't. Right. And we left the doctor's office and I was like, mom, he's wrong. Like I need to see somebody else. And so I was like, this isn't normal, you know? And so we scheduled an appointment at uh, Vanderbilt and within five minutes of talking to the neurologist, he was like, yeah, you've got Tourette's. I I was relieved. I'm sure almost everybody that has been officially diagnosed, um, I I got a sense of relief from it because, you know, I Mm -hmm. could finally put a name with what I've been dealing with. Absolutely. I was fortunate enough to where I, I went to, I felt like you and a couple of other, I went to a small private Christian school. Like, you know, like I, I didn't deal with large, large groups of people that um, right, yeah. I don't know. I knew everybody in my class, like 20, 20 people, you know, like I said, I didn't have problems socializing. I was just making noises and twitching. Um, but it was still nice to know, Hey, I can, this is where I can, I can tell people what this is. Right. Of course, yeah, my yeah, mom. Yeah. My mom took it a little bit harder. She started crying. She was devastated. She was just like, "Oh my gosh! Like I should have oh, listened boy. to you." And you know, of course, I don't blame her for anything. Like she didn't do anything I probably wouldn't have done, uh, not knowing what she didn't know. And um, but it was at that point, I think that while it was good to have an official diagnosis, that was when like my self confidence, like kind of dropped a little bit like it was like okay cool i have a name for this but oh no like now i have Tourette's. like yeah yeah so, so it was that sort of public shaming that you were worried yeah. about or yeah yeah it's like i almost felt sorry for myself even though yeah. i had no reason to like it had never stopped me from doing anything i just mm-hmm. felt this inadequate or something not you know not whole for some reason Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally get that. I mean, that, that was exactly, I mean, you know, remove Tourette syndrome from the context and this is the previous me talking, but remove Tourette syndrome from the context and, 
you know, I think I'm kind of normal, you know, like I'm, you know, into music and into like just mm. things norm- normal, you know, I, I played soccer when I was a kid and all that. It's just, yep. I, I, I'm getting through, I'm fine. I think I'm socially okay, but, um, but yeah, like, a, a, you know, add Tourette syndrome back in there and I kind of become a curiosity to myself and kind of, I, I, will really overanalyze myself and you know it's like this situation coming up here what if i come off weirdly what if everybody's are are, you know what if for my whole life people have thought you know like this guy's a weirdo he doesn't know it he can't sense it maybe it's because his tourette's is is doing something to i mean it's just it's nonsense talking about it now but but yeah i mean it does really affect your self-appraisal yeah um and i think that's the hard part about having tourette's is so there's there's like two parts of Tourette's. It's there's the part that people can see, okay, and 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 then there's the part that people can't see. So mm-hmm. you know, I'm sure anybody with a mild case of Tourette's, if you've told somebody, oh, I have Tourette's, one of the first things they're going to say to you is, oh, like you can't even tell. Like I I could I didn't even know. Like I would have never yep. known. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And I don't know how that's supposed to make me feel. Um, I don't yeah. know if like, oh, cool. Like I'm, I look normal or whatever, or I'm not bothering <laughs> them. Or at yeah. the same time, like I'm still dealing with it. Like it, it's, it's still super annoying to me. Like I, I wouldn't get rid of Tourette. You know, I know you've asked that question before. I wouldn't get rid of my Tourette's. It's made me who I am. I don't, yeah. I'm kind of scared of who I would be with. I, I love my personality. I love everything about me, but like it's annoying. It's really annoying. Um, there's yeah. days where you're just like, Oh my gosh, like I just can I stop totally. making noise or can I stop moving or can my brain just slow down? So like when you tell people oh, like, Oh, I have threats and, uh, you know, a, a positive reaction. And that's an example of like a semi positive reaction where they say, Oh, like, I, you know, maybe they're kind of, they're kind of caught. Like, uh, they don't know what to say. They didn't expect to hear that. Like they're kind of just like, yeah. Oh, well, I didn't even notice like, <laughs> yeah, oh, you know, yeah. or, you know, the best case scenario is like, you know, and I've experienced three different types of reactions at, at work. So, you know, the reaction I just told you about where they're kind of like, oh my gosh, like I didn't even know. And then there's the kind where they, the, a, a great reaction where they say like, oh, that's fascinating. Like, what's that like? And they ask you, they ask you a bunch of questions. They ask you good educated questions. And I have a hundred percent open to talking about it. Like Mm -hmm. I have no problem talking about it. It's just, it's just how we talk about it. And when I'm talking, it depends on how the conversation is going. Like sometimes I won't, I'm, I've caught myself not even being able to look people in the eye when I tell them or talk to them. Like I'm always averting, like, like if we lock eyes and I'm talking about this, that would make me feel really, really, really vulnerable. Which um, I don't know if, you know, I, I'm fine being vulnerable, but in this sense, it's like, ugh, like I don't know what you're thinking right now about <laughs> me, and we're working yeah. together. Um, and then there's the opposite. So the the this. So I've shown you the the okay, the great, and then there's the bad reaction where like this happened a couple of weeks ago. I had a um, one of my coworkers. She she jokingly. So I was featured, or I wasn't featured. I kind of showed up on a an episode of the TV show called raising Tourette's on a and E it's it's airing right now. And, um, I had told her that I was going to be on it. We were friends. So she told the pilot, like, uh, as we were getting ready to be playing and she, she was kind of joking, like, so let you know, Zach's going to be a big, big star. And like, I laughed, she laughed and everything. And he was like, what are you talking about? She's like, Hey, he's going to be on TV. And he's like, what show? And I said, raising Tourette's, Uh, I have Tourette's. And he just started laughing, uh, like uncontrollably. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting there now, had this been like a year or two years ago, um, I probably would have been, uh, completely shut off for the rest of the day. Um, but I've learned, I've kind of learned from situations like that. So he starts laughing and I just asked him, what's funny. Mm -hmm. I said, "What, what are you laughing at? He's like, Oh, you're serious. I said, yeah. Uh, and then he said something like, Oh, I guess like maybe I have Tourette's too. You heard me cussing in here earlier. Yeah, and, yeah. And yeah. and that's when I came back and I told him, well, actually, you know, that's 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 a tick. It's called coprolalia. Only about ten percent of people have that. That's not everything Tourette's is. And I kind of told him a little bit more. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I really, I just didn't want to talk to him anymore. Um, yeah. And then I've had some other instances and stuff where they just take yeah. that, that one generic stereotype. And this is not to like, this is not, I don't, I'm not taking anything away from those that are dealing with Coprolea as well. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, just totally as, get it. you know, that's just as, you mm-hmm. know, as tough to deal with as well, but that's also not the only, you know, thing with Tourette's, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I think you, you, you sort of addressed it the right way that, you know, uh, people do have their misconceptions and the things that they'll poke fun uh-huh. of and, you know, you, you don't take any dignity away from people who, who do have copper or anything else, um, by just flat out telling people kind of what they need to know to have a sense of context and to understand, you know, what your tics are like or what your Tourette's is like. And if they notice something about you that, well, okay, that might be one of my tics or, or you're not going to see me do this or, and, and it's not to, yeah, it's not to kind of explain away or kind of, you know, separate yourself from somebody else or, or, or what, you know, somebody else's life is like, because you think it's less right. valuable than yours. And, and, you know, it's, it's just, you just want them to kind of know what's up, um, in a way that I think basically values everybody in the room and gives them the information they need. And if they don't get it, then and it's, it's, it's on them. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, at some point you got to say, I've tried explaining it to you. That's sorry. Yeah. And that's like, I, I don't know if, um, like I said, about a year ago, that would have like, I would have, like I said, I'm a very outgoing person. I'm very, positive, optimistic. I like talking to people that would have just like shut me down. And that did happen like a year ago where somebody I was working with said something like that. And I was going from like having a great day. We were in, I was in Italy, like we were driving to the hotel and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to go explore the city. And this is great. And like, then they said something and it was like, Oh my gosh, like, Oh, that hurts. (laughs) But like now, like, I don't know. I've just kind of, I guess become more accepting of myself. And just yeah. like, this is me. Um, I, the there's key. a, there's a, uh, I think, I think it came from at camp, just the last couple of years volunteering at camp, just, um, kind of having to be a role model. I, I yeah. went into camp with the philosophy of trying to be somebody that I needed when I was younger. And now I'm trying to roll with that, That's like beautiful. even outside of camp, like, um, of course, I didn't know I had Tourette's when I was younger, but it's still, you know, there are these kids that do know that they have Tourette's and they don't have anybody that understands. And like, I understand what it's like to have family that doesn't understand you or that doesn't, you know, I've been yelled at by my family. Like, like everything's fine now, but like at the time, you know, I've been flat out just almost like scolded for making noise. And like that just, broke me when it happened but yeah like that's what i talked about kind of at my at the speech at the taa conference talking to the parents just like your words your words matter a lot more than you think they do you know i know you're Absolutely. there's days where you're frustrated or it's not easy to raise a kid in general but it's definitely not easy to raise a kid with Tourette's and just be cautious of the words you use and everything and the last year has been a big growth a big growing opportunity for me. And, um, I've, uh, I'm, I'm happy with where I've, where I'm at. I'm obsessed. I still want to continue to, to grow and to learn more about, I keep reading books about Tourette's I've read. Um, of course I read front of the class and then, uh, there was a book called Twitch and shout about mm-hmm. a, a photographer with Tourette's there's uh, like a historical book about it's called like the twitching disease or something like that. Basically it's like 200 pages of just like the history of Tourette's, which I'm excited to read about. And yeah, then, yeah, uh, yeah. Just any, anything I get my hands on about Tourette's I'm trying to learn it. I'm trying to watch it. Uh, the road with Ben awesome. is a good, is a good movie. I don't know if you've seen that one. No, not yet. Not um, yet. Just to kind of tie up a few things that you've said a about the camp and just kind of being a positive role model and being the person that you kind of wish you had. I mean, that's a beautiful thing to say. And that's a beautiful kind of line to follow, which, which I, that's kind of what maybe without having said it so plainly, that's sort of something I'm kind of hoping to do with myself. Uh, I, I do like reaching out to, uh, and, and talking with other people or, or even, a, you know, parents of kids who aren't really sure where to go yet. Cause their kids were just diagnosed and they don't have a, 
they're, they're finding conflicting information <clears throat> online and just tr- trying to at least, without me being an expert on anything but myself, just trying to kind of be, I don't know, just sort of a, without making it too dramatic sound and kind of a shoulder, I guess. And, or, or oh, at least absolutely. just kind of lending time, even if it's five minutes to, to re- return an email. I mean, it's just, it, it, it goes a long way. And so kind of what you were saying too about parents and kind of, you know, being careful about how they uh, address their kids' behavior, their tics, what they're going through and, and mm-hmm. the sort of level of empathy that you have to adopt without having had that experience yourself, which kind of makes me curious about uh, your your dad and the conversation that you guys had. But also yeah. one thing I want to say too is that when you talked about having conversations and kind of explaining things about your, your tics with people uh, and not making eye contact, mm-hmm. it's kind of funny because I'm not the kind of person to make eye contact. I'm just, that's right. just not me. I'll do it in job interviews because you're supposed to, but yeah. it's, that, that's, that's, you know, I'm not an eye contact. I'm not a powerful speaker or anything like that. It's just, but when I, I have noticed that since I've kind of come out about having Tourette syndrome and when I've explained it to people, I think I've kind of like overshot and gone the far other direction of making sure that I make eye contact with people because I think it's, it's supposed to make me come off more, you know, they're going to listen to me and I'm credible and they want to hear my story or something like that. I have no idea what my brain is thinking, but that no, that's probably has the been way one you time. Go. I mean, it's it's just something I've noticed about myself that feels unnatural even while I'm doing it, but seems important in that moment to kind of make sure that I'm heard when I'm trying to explain something that in the past I've not been good at explaining at because I just never talked about it. That's probably the way I should go. Um, I, I, I also just realized that one reason I probably avoid uh, extended eye contact, I have a, I got a tick where I like bulge my eyes like it looks like i'm surprised like you just like scared me or something yeah uh, yeah yeah and i, I, I definitely hate, have the like, same tick yeah i i uh whenever i see myself on a video or something like that i can't stand like that's that's one thing i'm like <laughs> it bothers me to see that i'm like oh my gosh like just keep your eyes normal size <laughs> for 10 seconds yeah yeah I've i've never seen myself do it but my uh, fiance tells me it's, it's the best tick I have. And, uh, so, so, so I guess I like that, or at least I like the fact that she likes it. Do you find that your ticks come in like pair? Like, so when I tick, when I, I have like a, I don't have a sniffling tick. I have like a snorting tick. So it's kind of the opposite mm-hmm. where I'm not, it's kind of a, a sharp exhale out my nose and I'll, draw my nose down as far as I can, like stretch it out almost. So whenever I stick mm-hmm. my tongue out, I immediately follow it with that. And I do the yeah. same thing whenever I like bulge my eyes, the, the nose blow comes afterwards. So it's like those two are always in pair and it looks ridiculous. So that's one reason <laughs> like when I see myself in a video or something and I do the eyes and then the nose comes, my face looks like something like Jim Carrey has like, you know, how he can like manipulate his face. It's like some some something from a movie but uh yeah. do you find that yours your ticks come in like pairs or yeah sometimes um it, with the vocal ticks that i have and um it's i, I kind of feel them coming on just by talking about them but uh yeah. th- this is this is where i don't know the difference between uh tick and habit because uh, there's one thing okay. that, that I absolutely know is a tick, but also it's a tick that I've always paired with something to mask it. But now I do them. I'm not masking my ticks anymore, but now I'm still, if I'll do a certain enough. vocal tick, which it sounds like, <clears throat> like kind of like yeah. that, I'll follow it with a throat clearing or a, or a cough or something. Yeah. And not because I'm consciously trying to do that anymore. I'm not trying to mask my ticks, but it always comes out that way now. So it's like this compound thing that I think I've maybe kind of manufactured for myself. So one is a pure tick for sure. The other is a mask sound that has, right. I guess, just kind of joined forces with it and has become this brand new kind of double decker tick that I have. Um, th- there are some others um, in sort of the movement category, but uh, not to the level where I would say there are too much to talk about. A lot of the ticks I have are kind of a succession of, of ticks, and that's the best I can say. It's funny you say that though, because um, I had never thought of it, but like that, like a manipulated movement rather than a tick. So when I stick my tongue out, oftentimes to to mask to mask that from other people that 
you know, should I lock like lock eyes with you while I'm sticking my tongue out, like to make it seem somewhat <laughs> yeah. normal? Um, I'll start stretching my jaw, so like my mouth's already open. So then I will like stretch it open even further and kind of move it from side to side. And I think I find myself doing that more and more just regularly without that premonitory urge of like a tick. Um, that was something that actually me and my dad talked about when he, you know, he he kind of. Um, yeah, let's hear about that. Yeah, he, he he just came up to me and he said, you know, um, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I had some nervous habits or tics when I was growing up. And he said, mm-hmm. um, and I, I thought I thought this was super interesting. So he talked about how he had what was it? Uh, he mentioned that he has TMJ too. So like some of the stuff he does is to relieve like tensions. But so he he does the same mm-hmm. like stre- jaw stretching. He does that a lot. He's got a like a throat clearing thing, which he does a lot, like more than an average person. So I could definitely see that being like a tick or something. Um, but then he said one, I've never heard him do this, but he said, and the way he described it, he was like, so I do this thing with my nose where like, instead of inhaling, I like exhale. And like, I was like, you mean like this? And he was like, yeah, that's exactly it. I was like, well, that's mm. a tick. I have that tick. Like, so we have the yeah. same, of course. I, I don't know to what extent if, if you were to go to a doctor <laughs> yeah. and I don't know if they would say, Hey, yeah, like, yeah, you have Tourette's or, um, whatever. <laughs> but, uh, it was interesting that he brought that up, you know, cause we never really, none, nobody in my family ever really talks about it. Like yeah. it's just kind of, which I'm fine with, I guess. Like my mom's the only one that'll be like, occasionally if, if she'll, the only time she'll bring it up is if she notices that I am, taking really bad. So right before I went down to uh, Atlanta for this job interview for my job, um, I was taking probably the worst I ever had in my life. I was just, I mean, my face would take everything. I was making tons of noise. My face was all sorts of all over the place. And she was like, are you, I think she was, it's kind of pissed me off too. She was, she asked me if I was okay. And she was worried for me. She was basically worried that I wouldn't get hired because of this. Like if I, if I walk in there ticking like this, what are they going to think? And that kind of made mm-hmm. me mad because, because she kind of, in the way she, what, I forget what she asked or whatever. And she didn't mean anything by this. Like my mom's a saint. She's an angel. And I love her very much. If you're listening, mom, hi. But, um, it just pissed me off. Like the, to think that like, I wouldn't get this job because of it. Like it's never stopped me before from doing anything. I, I've never let it stop me and I'm not going to. And I was very yeah. confident in my abilities and myself to get this job. Um, but like, that's really the only time it gets brought up is if, um, if it's bad, like, you know, she'll just say, are you okay? Like what's going on? Cause she knows that stress makes it worse. So like, what are you, what are you stressing about? What are you, but my brother's never asked me about it. My dad really doesn't talk about it. My grandparents, the only time my grandparents ever mentioned anything about it was like the day I got diagnosed. I got all these text messages that <laughs> looking back, they're pretty funny. They're like, Oh, honey, it's gonna be okay. Like we we still love you. Like we love you, or whatever. <laughs> like like I was dying or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um. But it's pretty <laughs> much been a. Um. I mean, uh, nobody's talked about it. Um. Which I guess is cool. Um. Mm-hmm. I don't know. How do you do? You like? Do you do you talk about it with? I'm sure you, you and your fiance talk about it. But I mean, does your family talk about it? Do you enjoy? Do you want to talk to someone about it? Like. You know, yeah. There, it's it's. I kind of have like a new wave of, of wanting to talk about it, but I think it's because of also this kind of newfound pride, I guess, is a way to say it. Um, back in the day, yeah, like just didn't want to talk about it. Didn't want to feel, you know, quote unquote special, or didn't want to feel like I was on display because people have this new curiosity about me. If they find out just, I I never really like people, I guess it's kind of a paradox. I mean, you know, I, I, I like, you know, nice, kind treatment and you yeah. know, compliments and things like that. But at the same time, I didn't really want people to focus on me. I was kind of wanted to be kind of, you know, side stage, kind of a fly on the wall type person in a situation. So, um, growing up, uh, depending on who I was with, I wouldn't be very talkative, uh, you know, e- even as an adult too. I mean, I just, mm-hmm. sometimes I'm just kind of sitting in the corner of the couch and watching people hang out. That's kind of what I feel like sometimes. If I'm with my really close friends, not the case at all, you know. Um, right. But, but so this past weekend, I had uh, my friends threw a bachelor party for me. I'm getting married Ooh, nice. uh, at 
at this point. So it's August 30th right now as we're talking. Um, at the end of September, we're you know, Congratulations. getting married. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and, and it's funny because these are my f- the same group of friends. Nobody was a stranger to each other. We've all known each other for you know, like the past 20, 25 years. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. But uh, most of them, I, I would say almost all of them had no idea I had Tourette syndrome because I never talked about it. Wow. But I really enjoyed kind of, and, and this was not a, a theme throughout the weekend, but I did have a couple conversations there and answered some questions and I really enjoyed it. It was just kind of, I don't know, liberating in a way for them to, to I guess, kind of know me in a more accurate way. And it probably answered some questions, you know, yeah. f- uh, that they've had about me for a while when it comes to just like, like the eyeball thing. I kind of mm-hmm. feel like I've noticed some of them looking at each other and being like, did you just see that? What yeah. I would do that eyeball tick, it, yeah. that sort of thing. And, and so I, I kind of like the cleansing feel of it now. Whereas before I felt like I was just setting myself up to be on display in a way that I would just, my, my body rejects it. It just gives me this really weird feeling to be looked at and talked about. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't, I, I don't remember ever having like a specific conversation with all of my like really good friends um, Mm -hmm. about it. Like there wasn't like a a aha moment, like, or like I told them, but I I do remember one thing that stands out. One of my best friends, I think I'd asked him about it. I was like, so like, what do you think about my Tourette's? And he was like, well, you make noises, but like, it's whatever, like, that's just who you are. I'm like, and so, Mm -hmm. and that just made me feel really good. Cause like I I spent a lot of time with him. Um, now like these days like him and his wife and they have a kid and um like i don't ever have to feel self-conscious about being around them you know and that's how it is with a lot of my close friends like i'm never worried about what they're thinking but like you know outside of that group it's like Mm -hmm. okay let's let's try to where am i okay yeah is it quiet is it you know can i hide this or can i you know but it's nice though to finally like to be able to just have that those people that you know you can just be yourself around. I, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a better way to say that, but like, yeah, I feel like a yeah. lot of the times we find ourselves hiding in plain sight sometimes. Totally. Um, but like, do you do you have? I mean, I, it's probably your fiance, but like, you know, if you have when you have bad tick days, do you talk about that with somebody? Do you? Um, or do you just go somewhere quiet and just live out? Like, how do you do that? Yeah, it's, it's my fiance. I mean, th- th- there are definitely a good number of days where I'll come home and I'll, where it's maybe a particularly <laughs> stressful day at work or a deadline day where I have to turn something in or get something done. And it's, you know, kind of a rush at the last minute to make sure everything's, you know, ready to be turned in and the bosses are going to like it and all that kind of a high stress feeling. And that will definitely set off my ticks. And, you know, plenty of days where I come home and I tell her, you know, like, yeah, it was a bad tick day or, you know, and and as soon as I'm home, it kind of diffuses a bit because she makes me feel just, I mean, it's not just that she makes me feel comfortable. It's just like, it's not an issue at all. There, There was nothing to, to think about or worry about or anything like that. But, um, so it, it's it, her presence is kind of good enough to where I don't even have to say anything. But when I do, you know, it's she leaves the the door open to to talk about it, and which I've always appreciated. And or she'll ask maybe like what what ticks, like what um, what were you doing, like what was it, and and it's kind of a good sort of mental bulletin board to kind of follow what ticks I'm doing over time. Mm-hmm. And cause I I found that reaching back of maybe the past 10 years and the the 10 year period where previous to 2018, where I just wasn't talking about it, wasn't open about it, didn't want anybody to know about it. I wasn't tracking myself. I was just a guy with Tourette syndrome who kind of lived quietly about it. Mm-hmm. Um, now that I've kind of opened up and I do talk about it more, I do keep track of my ticks more. And it's interesting to me to kind of see what, you know, what's hanging over me now, um, what, you know, what ticks are bothering me, which ones keep me up at night. Um, why am I sleeping so well right now? That, that kind of thing. And I don't know what to do with that or where to go with it, but so the episode, um, 
might have been episode three of season one with Melissa C. Water, where she mm-hmm. kind of views her Tourette syndrome as a companion. That was the word she used. I feel like it's more than ever true. Um, just in talking about it and kind of and recognizing it and, and, and having people to talk to about it, it, it does kind of make it more of a character in my life rather than something that I wish I didn't have. And, and to clarify, I've never wished I didn't have it. There might be particular right. moments that are bad, but, but in all, um, it just kind of feels like a nice part of my life now that I don't have to worry about. That's nice. Have, have you ever, I, I've thought about this more lately than, than ever before, just with the, the back tick. Um, have you ever counted your ticks? I, I, that's, it'd be very difficult to do, but have you ever tried to like, or heard of anybody trying to keep track of how many like ticks you have mm-hmm. in a day? Uh, I, it would be really difficult to track just because it would require an immense amount of focus, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know, because uh, someone has asked me, I mean, that that question has come up of, um, you know, when one of my friends or a coworker who's interested in learning more, like, how often do you do it? You know, and it's usually prefaced with, like, I don't don't see you tick very often, that kind of thing, or I'd never seen you tick. So it's, you know, how, like, when do you do it? How often does it happen? And I mean, it's pretty steady. It's these sort of invisible ticks that you know, you wouldn't see or breathing related ticks or, or something mm. I'm just disguising. But I mean, it's so steady that I've always used the word thousands. Like, I feel like it just happens thousands of times yeah. a day. And yeah. I, I mean, it could be whatever, 500, but, uh, it's, it's so steady. So I will say that ear popping tick, which, uh, I regret talking about now because I don't want <laughs> it to come back. I've been off it for a bit right? and it's been nice. Um, but that thing was constant. I mean, it was two to three times a second. It was just so oh, no. quick. It would go throughout the day. I would have horrible headaches. And I mean, that was a painful tick. That was one I, that I would medicate if there was a way to target that yeah. and not turn into a zombie. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's I, I at least know that it's steady enough to say thousands in a semi-accurate way. Do you, do you find... Um... Two questions. So do you, do you find yourself that, is there like a, a point of no return for your say? So like, uh, for instance, uh, this happened a month or so ago, we actually had a, an engine failure in the air and, um, oh my gosh. it was, I noticed uh, yeah, everything turned out fine. But like, after okay, that, okay. I noticed that like my ticks, like there was no like settling down from this. Like I, I knew that the rest of the day I would be taking mm-hmm. like, on 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 a level ten all day long, and I was. Yeah. Um. Have you, have you found that there's like a certain point to you that you get where you just the only way to fix it is to just like go to sleep or, um, or yeah. are there ways that you cope with those really stressful that you know? Of course, there's like meditation, and that's really difficult. I feel like for someone with Tourette's, but um. Anything, I, I don't know, what, do you have any, anything? Kind of, you... yeah. I mean, for, for me, it's, yeah, and th- there's definitely those days where I know it's going to be a really bad tick day, and I'll know it, you know, when I wake up, almost. It's, and it's usually, I guess, kind of dictated by what's on the agenda for that day, or do I have a deadline? Is it going to be, is there something big happening today that I have to be ready mm-hmm. for, or and and it usually has to be a kind of a stressful situation. I mean, the, the, I can be in a good mood and tick and all that, but if I'm dreading something uh, that's going to happen that day, it's the car ride to work is ticks. You know, I have a 35 minute commute in the morning where, where you know, I drive from driveway to driveway. It's about 35 minutes and it's constant ticking the whole time in those situations. When I get to work, uh, I'm kind of in a corner. I'm kind of hidden away a little bit. It's still mm-hmm. kind of a... Uh, it's like an open office cubicle kind of situation. And yeah. um, if it's, I, I make a habit anyway of getting up and walking around and taking the elevator down, taking a walk around the block. And those are good relief times for me because it's kind of a busy downtown city atmosphere. And I can do my vocal tics. And if somebody notices at this point, I don't care, but I, I kind of think they just don't hear it. So it's, mm-hmm. um, it's a comfortable environment for me to be in, but if it's carrying on into the night after I get home, the only thing I can hope for is just something 
that makes me feel good or is entertaining or a movie or something like that, right. where hopefully I can just kind of drift into a different mindset and let myself settle down or what I'm watching is so interesting to me that I laser focus on that and my ticks, if I'm doing them, they don't bother me as much or I'm just not doing them as much because I'm just kind of giving my brain something new to do. And I don't know what the science of that is. That's just how it works with me. No, I feel the same way. I'm glad you mentioned movies because like, I love watching movies. I love going to the movies. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it's just like a, it's like two hours of just, I forget I have Tourette. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I love, I mean, like even, even acting, like I did some acting in college at a murder mystery dinner theater and it was probably my <laughs> favorite job ever. Oh, that's awesome. Because for two and a half hours, every Friday and Saturday, like I, I, I totally forgot I had to, I was taking the whole time, but I forgot I had Tourette's like, you know, I would get done with the show and be exhausted. Cause I realized like, Oh my gosh, I've been twitching this whole time. But like, it was never, I was never felt bad about it, never, whatever. So I was able to go to that place, like you said, with a movie or TV show or whatever, and just like, just be, be free for a little bit. Or even like you said, if it doesn't, even if you're taking, it doesn't bother you. Um, yeah. Yeah. But did, did you find kind of security in, in playing a part? Uh, if, uh, if that's, uh, you yeah, know, anything actually, like that? Yeah. Um, I think I did just because it at least gave me something to focus on. You know, like I had yeah. my lines, I had my cues. Um, and this was, this, I mean, this is like, I mean, it was nothing like a huge, it was a, just a little low budget, you know, improv theater. We didn't even rehearse. We never, we never did a single rehearsal. We literally just winged it. We had our lines and everything. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I feel like playing that part. Yeah, for sure. Because if nothing else, it just gave me something to focus on. And I feel like, you know, that like if, if you're focused on something for a long time, like hard, then you're going to, you may, you still may tick, but you're not going to be concerned about it. So between the yeah. lights and then being in front of everybody, I, that was causing me to take, just being nervous. I was taking a lot, you know? Yeah. Um, but I found that um, it didn't bother me from like a mental standpoint like it normally would. And, and kind of in a, maybe a, a small string of just thinking about acting and TV and all that just has yeah. me thinking about the A&E show. Uh, mm-hmm. So you, you're on an episode of Raising Tourette's on A&E. Like how did that come together? Yeah. Um, so the director of camp twitch and shout she put me in touch with the producers at uh half yard productions um i think it's half i think that's the name of the production company but um Mm -hmm. he reached out and said hey we're looking for a we're we're filming a show you know following like the lives of five teenagers with tourettes trying to show a different side of tourettes that society may not have seen before um more so an educational show more so than a reality TV show. And we're looking for someone like in their mid twenties, that's out of college, like has a, you know, trying to show kind of a successful, not to say that I'm like super successful or anything, but like someone that's dealing with it, you know, Mm -hmm. um, that's been, been through the ring and everything. And, And so they flew me to Iowa to meet, um, a kid on the show that had just recently been diagnosed and was kind of in that first, that post diagnosed kind of denial, kind of not sure how to feel about it, not how to handle it. Just a bunch of questions kind of thing. And I met him and his family and, um, answered questions and talked and gave him advice. And, um, and last night it aired, uh, they aired a little bit of it. I think there's going to be more, um, on episode five, but there's, it's a six part series. And okay, I think yeah. ep- ep- episode five is going to show a little bit more of our interaction because last night was just our Skype call, um, mm. but they didn't show any of the stuff of when, when we actually met in person. So I'm hoping gotcha. they'll show that because um, there's a lot of good stuff. I don't remember anything I said, but I remember feeling really good about it. So, uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> but uh, nice. yeah, that, that's, uh, that's been that aired August 15th and it ends like September like 19th or something like that. Yeah. Um, on A&E, it comes on right after Born This Way. 
Um, and I've, there's been a lot of positive feedback, um, from people. Also, there's been some of the feedback I've just seen on, you know, I'm on Twitter and stuff during the show. And I noticed a lot of people have kind of struggled to watch it because they're the kids, are, the kids kind of don't want to watch it because they're scared. They're going to pick up a tick or yeah. mm-hmm. something like that. Um, and, and that breaks my heart because I feel like the show would be really really helpful just to let them know that like there's other kids going through what they're going through and mm-hmm. you know, you're not in this alone. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, like, uh, you can pick up ticks anywhere, like with any, you yeah. know, like so, you don't pick and choose where your ticks come from. Obviously when you're <laughs> around other people with Tourette's, you do tick more. Um, I don't know if you, have you been around anybody else with Tourette's? Um, not, in much of a way to talk about. I mean, uh, so I had a uh, pen pal friend when I was a little kid who had Tourette syndrome and we, you okay. know, hung out a couple of times, but I mean, no, not, not really. Okay. It's, it's always been me kind of, and, and I've seen other people kind of out in public where I'm like, it's, yeah. it's blatant that they have Tourette syndrome. I identify yeah. exactly with what they're doing, how they're holding them themselves. And um, just in terms of having that sort of, group atmosphere or a friend I could turn to who has it, that sort of thing just never happened with me. I see, no, that's where, like, life. Right. Like that's where, like when I found out about camp Twitch and shout, I was kind of like in disbelief because up until that point I'm 23 and I've never met anybody else with Tourette's and yeah. I never really thought about it. But, uh, and of course my very, very first, uh, interaction when I showed up for training for the counselors, like it was the most, stereotypical like it was a group we were at a church and there were probably like 50 counselors and it was mm-hmm. like five or six people with coprolalia that were like you, you know just super loud um someone yeah. screeching like a pterodactyl like it, it was like every, uh, i was like overwhelmed you know um yeah. but like i've i've come to be so thankful that i ended up going to the camp because like now i keep in touch with those people all the time, you know, they're good friends. And uh, just having that, like, like you said, that group, that support system to where you can say like, Hey, I'm having a rough, t-. of course you have your fiance and like, and then like, she sounds amazing. Like legitimately, like everything you've said about how supportive mm-hmm. and everything like that's, that's yeah, what, like, the best. That, that's what you, you know, <laughs> uh, that's like the hashtag goals, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I come home and I'm just like, I text somebody, one of my friends from camps, like have, so I'm having a rough tick day. Like, um, my medical is like out of control. Like, uh, my, my neck is killing me or my whatever, or this happened or this happened. And it's nice to have that little like support group. So of course there's all the, there's a bunch of Facebook groups and stuff that have other people have talked about, you know, there's TikTok and for the parents mm-hmm. and the kids and, um, everything else, but it's yeah. nice. It's nice being, I don't know, we feel like some, one of my friends, he said, he called us the X-Men. We're like the X-Men with less cool powers, but powers <laughs> <don't>, nonetheless. <laughs> Man, if I can find a way to not get sued, I'm going to title this episode, yeah. The X-Men. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can say like, you know, we're, we're like superheroes with less cool powers. <laughs> yeah, maybe the uh, Tread Association has like some legal counsel I can, I can run this yeah. by. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I had a question for you, actually. Um, I think you had, you had brought it up or somebody else brought it up. How does exercise affect your ticks? Because I, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, I exercise regularly, but it always makes my ticks worse. Um, I have a breathing tick where I'll, I'll wheeze really heavily, like mm-hmm. really strong, and then inhale yeah. in a weird way. Um, and yep. so when I get out of breath, I do that a lot. And it also makes running difficult because... Anytime mm-hmm. I'm running and I start doing that, obviously my breaths are like way off sync and I'm sitting there like hyperventilating and, um, yeah. do, do you deal with that or anybody? A- everything you, talk to? you just, yeah, everything you just said is me. I mean, okay. I, I, so exercise for me is two things. It's either mowing the lawn or it's going on a jog. And yeah. I, I like walking a lot. I mean, walking, I, I, f- I feel like walking by itself is a very therapeutic thing for me. And I, I do it every chance I get. 
long mm-hmm. walks, you know, on the weekends, take the camera out, you know, photograph stuff. I mean, that's, that's yeah. just kind of pleasurable to me. But when it comes to something that I'm doing for a discipline like jogging um, or lawn mowing or, or you know, whatever, that, something that requires some kind of, you know, uh, stamina to do. I will breathe oddly. My breathing ticks will definitely perk up. My breathing ticks are some of my least favorite ticks because I'll either mm-hmm. hold my breath or I'll breathe really uh, unevenly. And I have asthma and it definitely inflames that. So I will cause myself to wheeze by uh, doing these, just like you said, that, that kind of like wheezing kind of exhale. I'll mm-hmm. totally do that. And uh, it, it messes with me. And it's, you know, I, I'm... 38. I want to stay ahead of the curve as far as being yeah. healthy, like physically healthy. Yeah. Uh, want to run more, uh, but it's just, yeah. That, and, and I feel like that's something that's perked up in the past handful of years. I don't remember it being like that when I was a kid. I played soccer and all that, and I could, you know, I, I did fine. But uh, as an adult, doing something as simple as jogging has become kind of a a challenge, and I do it oh, yeah. anyway just because I need to. But it's, yeah, it. it it definitely inflames me. It's like that's 22 kind of where, you know, you need to, you know, you need to do this, but at the same time, it's like, um, it's hard. It's, it's a lot harder. I, I tried to get into running for a little bit. Um, and I, I had this mm-hmm. tick where I would, when I got tired, I would have to knock my knees together. So I needed to feel like the yeah. pressure. And so like, I just about fell down every time I tried to run. Um, and so, like, obviously, like, I don't yeah. run a lot anymore. <laughs> I just stick mostly to, like, weights and stuff. <laughs> but, uh, again, with the, you know, like you said, it's like, uh, I'll almost make myself out of breath with this stupid, like, wheezing tick. Um, I was just curious if, that, if, if I was alone in that or if that was something other people go through. I've, I've heard both. I've, I've heard of people turning to exercise to, uh, I think it was Brittany Wolf. Um, actually I can't remember what her answer was. I don't want to misquote her, but from season one, I remember because she's a fitness person and I think that's something she kind of turned to, uh, as an answer, like something that would help her out. And, uh, I, but I've, I've heard, you know, a couple other people say exactly what we just talked about, how, you know, they're, they're fitness junkies. They love it, but you know, their ticks definitely, flare up and it's just something they have to deal with while they're doing it yeah um the a good thing though, at the gym though you can get away with a lot of your a lot of your ticks just as you can kind of just play it off like you're really amped up or i have a clapping tick yeah. where i have to clap real loud and <laughs> so like yeah it'll, it'll be sitting there and hear me i'll just make it play like i'm about to do a huge lift or something or start grunting and mm-hmm. have to be careful at certain gyms or right. the lunk alarm will go yeah. off but <laughs> well, that's the kind of tick where people cheer you on. All right, all right, right. Thanks for listening. Uh, since I'm just getting back home, essentially, from a lot of travel, um, I'm kind of catching up on things back here, and I haven't gotten through all the emails and voice memos yet. So if you've emailed me and I haven't responded, I'm getting right to it, I promise. And I'll follow up with everything on the next episode. But keep the correspondence coming, uh, Tourette's Podcast at gmail.com. Or you can find me on Twitter, at Tourette's Pod. Or get over to the uh, discussion group, because membership is really building over there, and there's a lot of quality talk happening. Tourette's Podcast Discussion Group on Facebook. If you're enjoying this podcast or getting anything out of it, please leave a nice review on iTunes. Help new listeners find it, uh, or share it with people you know. I've done some polling on Twitter, and I'm actually impressed at how, how much word of mouth accounts for new listeners. I thought it would, it would just be purely social media. But a lot of people are coming to this podcast just because somebody told them about it. So thank you for sharing the show. Uh, it doesn't have to just be people with TS in the audience. I want everybody to listen. Tourette'spodcast.libsyn.com for all past episodes. Libsyn is spelled L-I-B-S-Y-N. Tourette'spodcast.libsyn.com or just subscribe on your podcast app. Thanks, and we'll talk to you next week. This is Ben.